it is so special to be part of an organization with so much history that uh -huh. has some of these these things that are layered in, you uh -huh. know, and and you're, the stadium's built into the community, and yeah. you feel like you're part of the of the of the city of the north side there in Wrigleyville, and they call it that for a reason because you're like you literally are walking down the street and you see people all the time and yeah. say hi to the firemen at the fire station. And when does when does one wear the the World Series ring? Yeah, I'm kicking Obviously myself not for a podcast. I, I know I'm <laughs> kicking myself for not having it today. But um, I think you the know, most important thing is you've heard stories about people running over <laughs> with a car, put it on their mattress. Don't put it in the microwave. Don't you know, microwave <laughs> like. The, the number one thing I like... In so I believe that you got hired as the coordinator of advanced scouting with an emphasis in run prevention. Yes. Is that right? That's yeah. a heck of a title. Um, how did you bounce so fast from pitching in spring training and then when you got that new role with the Cubs? All right, welcome into the Beyond the Glove podcast presented by Just Gloves. I'm your host today, Ben Loafman, and we are joined by one of Just Gloves' favorite sons, which I'll explain here in a little bit, Tommy Hadovy, the current pitching coach for the Chicago Cubs. Thanks for coming on with us. Today. Yeah, Ben, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's exciting uh, to have you here, um, but we'll just stop, hop in right from the beginning. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll explain why you're one of our favorite sons, but how did everything start for you? Where did, um, for you, uh, where, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Yeah, so um, from Kansas City, you mm -hmm. know, right right around here where kind of the roots of Just Gloves and, and the pro athlete, you know, group all came from. And, um, you know, grew up around here, grew up a huge Royals fan, grew up going to games at the K and, mm -hmm. and, and really uh, enjoying baseball and, and life around here. Um, went to Park Hill and Park Hill South. I was the first class at Park Hill South. So okay. it shows you how old I am. That's <laughs> 20, 20 years now <laughs> that that school has been around, but nice. you know, um, went to Park Hill for two years, first class at South. And then I, uh, got a baseball scholarship to go play at Wichita state. So, um, been local. Um, we moved back here a couple of years ago, just mm -hmm. really low. Obviously I've, I've been fortunate enough to get to live at a lot of different places in the yeah. country. And, it always always brings you back to to the Midwest and being around family and stuff. So we were, we're excited to be back. Nice. And for you growing up, so obviously you mentioned you uh, you went to Wichita State, uh, played for the Royals and the Red Sox in the major leagues. Did you know right from the beginning was it, was it baseball all the way, or did you excel at other sports growing up? No, I mean I I, I loved playing baseball. I mean, mm -hmm. That was like my first sport that I really felt like you know I loved to do. Mm -hmm. um, always played basketball growing up too. Played soccer, um, but then when I got to seventh grade, I really wanted to play football. It was okay. the first time I, I wanted to do something different, uh -huh. and and I just was kind of a natural just on the field, being able to have space and run and and play quarterback and a couple other positions. So like football became a really fun sport for uh -huh. me and one that I excelled at pretty pretty quickly and through high school. But then I always kept coming back to the fact that I just loved baseball. Mm -hmm. I loved practicing baseball. I loved playing baseball. I loved watching baseball. Football was different. Football is like, <laughs> I love Friday nights yes. in, in high school. Uh -huh. Bottom line, hate practice. Yeah. yeah. I, I watch it. I watch the Chiefs. I watch, you know, some teams that I like, but I just, you know, kept coming back to that. When I had the decision, because I had, I had some, some football scholarship op offers and mm -hmm. some things that I could do there, I just kept coming back to the fact, like, you know, I want to play baseball. I think for my body, physically, it was mm -hmm. the right decision. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now even though I've had plenty of injuries playing baseball, but a lot of that's from longevity more so than like a, you know uh, acute injuries. But um, yeah, and then and I made that decision to go to Wichita State. I had a couple of schools, Arkansas, and Nebraska, and some of the teams that wanted me to dabble in both uh -huh. and Wichita State didn't have a football team. So yeah. it kind of took that temptation out. <laughs> Plus the history of what they were able to do and what yeah. they in, in late nineties when I was going there it was going to be two thousand one. Mm -hmm. Um they had a had really good program and yeah. really good, really good coaching staff and really hit home a lot of things that I valued and, and believed in. So it was a it was a good fit for sure. So now that you've led into it, I have to say it here. I actually printed this out so I get it right. So at WSU <laughs> 
You played under a legend, Gene Stevenson. Uh, we probably have a lot of people listening who, so Gene Stevenson here in the Midwest, like everybody knows him for baseball. With Wichita State, over 1,700 wins. This is pretty cool. 50-plus All-Americans, mm-hmm. 27 NCAA tourneys, seven trips to Omaha, and one national championship. It's quite a resume for a coach to have. And, so. and not only that, like he built that program from scratch. Really? Like when, when he took over, I think it was 1984, there was no team. Okay. Like he came in. There was no facility. There was no field. Uh-huh. There was nothing. They, they basically built – they pulled – brought trailers into this baseball field to – build stands okay. they brought portable um like facilities where yep. guys could change into they didn't have locker rooms they didn't have anything uh-huh. he recruited joe carter to come mm-hmm. play there and and a lot of these guys were football players first okay and then they he like recruited them to play baseball okay. so like when i <laughs> like not only the accolades what he was able to accomplish and all of the all americans the countless guys that played in the big leagues or have coached mm-hmm. in the big leagues or have had you know some some major league, you know, influence to to go through that from like basically building it from nothing is yeah. is pretty amazing. And if you've been, I everybody go ahead and look it up right away. X Stadium in Wichita is like a Taj Mahal of of baseball stadiums. You always hear about SEC, but like their stadium's awesome. It, it it's so tall as well, like from behind home plate. Like yeah, I mean it, we right. were we were a college team, and you know, in two thousand two two thousand three, we were getting we we're averaging I think seven or eight thousand. Uh-huh. fans um we had really good teams and and even since then for the people that have the guys that have gone through there you've had like you know um the have had connor gillespie you've had mm-hmm. mike pelfrey andy yeah. dirks like um alec Baum. Yeah. you know like we've had a lot of really good players even since the early 2000s that have gone on to do really good things and and add that to all the guys that came before them and had a lot of really good careers. They've continued to build that program and build the facilities there. They now have an amazing indoor facility, which I wish we would have had because <laughs> we were outside practicing all the time. Um, the locker room facility is amazing. Like they just continue to build and, mm-hmm. and grow that program. And it's, it's fun to see. Yeah. And one thing, so I, when I was looking this up, I, I've heard this about Gene Stevenson before. This was an incredible story. So I've heard that he has an absolute legendary handshake. Mm-hmm. And before he'd go out to shake the coach's hand, and like the first comment he'd have coming back, he'd be like, "I beat him in the handshake. We're winning," or something. Got like him that. again. Yeah. He'd always say, "I got him again." <laughs> and there was this, there was this thing. Like by the time you get to a senior, uh-huh. you like make it a game with him. It's yeah. like who can beat Gene to the handshake, <laughs> like. And and guys would try, and you could just never do yeah. it, never do it. And 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 Gene. Love him. Like one of the best things, the funniest things he always used to say, his line was meek little bunny puppies. And okay. that was like his thing. And he was, and we were like, Hey Gene, how was his handshake? And he's like, yeah, meek little bunny puppy. You know, like <laughs> that was like what he would say every single time. Really? And, and, but it was like, you, it, it was one of those things you were out there for the national anthem for the game. Uh-huh. And then everybody stands and watches the interaction between Gene and the coach and yeah. the umpires. Cause he's, he's going to crush everybody. Really? He's yeah. going to crush him. It's a, it's a legendary handshake. No That's doubt. hilarious. Nice. So when you're playing there, so you're there Oh one to Oh four. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Okay. Mm-hmm. So usually when we think of, um, you know, high draft picks, which you were, you were fourth mm-hmm. round by the Red Sox in 2004, we're usually thinking about a guy 10 to 15 starts a year, Friday night starter usually. And when I was looking at your career at Wichita State, it was probably a little bit more of a grind than you would think. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it's crazy how it worked out for you in the end because I think I saw you had three starts as a co- college pitcher. But I was looking, you were nails, your, I think your sophomore and junior year, and your senior year, you were a monster out of the bullpen. Yeah. So how did that, how do you remember um, your pitching career at Wichita State. Yeah, so I, I liken it back to what I said about <clears throat> playing football. Mm-hmm. The reason I liked football was because of the game. Mm-hmm. I hated that you only played once a week. Okay, yeah. And so in college, if you're a starter, you're, mm-hmm. you're pitching one time a week. Yeah. And to me, that was I, ne- I needed to be on the field more. I had, mm-hmm. I had actually gotten recruited to play outfield as well. It was like outfield and pitch. Um, I broke my wrist my freshman year, so I kind of – through the the swinging aspect out, but I just love being able to be on the field and compete. And I didn't like the thought of only being able yeah. to pitch one game, uh-huh. you know, and go five innings. So what what I ended up doing early is I, you know, I I just want to be in the bullpen. I want to be available. I, cause cause at Wichita State too, 
our conference was was good. We had a couple uh-huh. of good teams, but it wasn't like the Big Twelve, and it wasn't like the you know SEC and that kind of stuff. So we were playing KU, K State, Missouri, mm-hmm. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, or Roberts midweek. Okay. I didn't want to miss those games, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? No. And and so what I ended up getting to do was get into a nice little run where, like, midweek I'd be kind of like the long guy mm-hmm. coming in right away if it's if we're in a close game. And then I'd close Friday night behind Mike Pelfrey, and then uh-huh. I'd get to pitch Saturday or, or Sunday. You know, I'd get to pitch three times a week. Yeah. And then when we'd have those weekends where we'd blow somebody out yeah. and I was fresh, I might start. Yep. Mid, a midweek game. You know, okay. I might get to start against KU. I, I started a game at KU. I think I went five innings. It was like like my second start in my college career. But uh-huh. it was just like, yeah, I'm fresh. I'm ready. And plus, yeah. I wanted like I, those were all teams in schools that told me I wasn't good enough to go there. Oh, so I there wanted. I, nice. I didn't want to miss those games. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's nice. That's pretty cool though. And with again, kind of going back to the community around there, like. The WSU, they're, the fans are rabid, too. So mm-hmm. it's like you're showing out. I, you, you had mentioned a little bit earlier, but I think your senior year, I looked it up, you guys had over 100,000 people show up yeah. to your games throughout the season, which is pretty impressive. So It, it was like, crazy. That's like, what do you get, maybe 30 home games or yeah. something like that? So yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, no, I love, and you mentioned Alec, Alec Baum, too, like just seeing him. It's, I It would be awesome for like watching the college world series to be able to have WSU back up there. Yeah, so. no doubt. No doubt. Um, but we mentioned, so you got, you got drafted 2004 with the Red Sox and that's kind of where, so pro athlete is our, uh, what I would say our parent company yeah. here. So just bats, our sister company, uh, we're run by the company pro athlete incorporated. And I think it was around 2006 in the off season, you started working here. Is that correct? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. How did that get started? Yeah. So I'd known, you know, the the parent company, Pro Athlete, mm-hmm. and the founders, the family, the Hedricks, um, and a lot of the people that I had grown up around. Like the the people don't I don't think realize that Pro Athlete was the mom and pop like sporting goods store on the corner like uh-huh. of the neighborhood and you got your letter jackets there you <laughs> went and ordered cleats out of catalogs you ordered bats and gloves and that's kind of how it started and then when scott obviously started taking things to the next level and making things online and 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 really developing the rest of these companies like he you know it was blowing up uh-huh. and and the timing of all of it for me with my season and what they what they were trying to do was during the during the summer when I was playing was their busiest like a lot of their busiest time too because mm-hmm. there's a lot of activity a lot of you know summer uh, baseball guys buying equipment and then obviously the the holiday season is a yeah. big portion too so I was gonna come in and help out with some things like in that um, in the winter uh-huh. you know especially get just another set of hands when we yeah. had orders and things coming in but my background was in finance um, and economics minor um, plus my baseball background like there were some. Yeah. odd and end projects that they just didn't have people at the time. It was a smaller, yeah. you know, smaller group. It's not like the, the amount of people we <laughs> yeah. have now. <clears throat> so there were just some things that they wanted to kind of like explore. And, mm-hmm. and every year it kind of started with me coming in. They had some thoughts about some things they wanted to do and, and kind of wanted to, I, I was looking to make money cause I wasn't making any money <laughs> playing minor league baseball back then. Uh-huh. Um, so it was kind of like a really good fit. And and I was giving pitching lessons up here and yeah. and doing different things. So it was like, I'm here anyway. Like, why don't I come work for four or five hours during Absolutely. the day? And then I would get my workout in, my throwing in, then I'd do lessons. And um, and it was just a good fit. And it just became like a a, a thing that, one, I mean, I, I, I give pro athlete, the Hedrick family, the people that have been in this company for a long time, a lot of credit for the success that I had because they let me survive. Like them, me having a job here and getting to work Mm -hmm. prolonged my career because it it was just hard. It was hard in the minor leagues to be able to make the money you needed to do to be successful. But I loved getting to, to stay focused on my the the numbers side the analytical side and there were some fun projects we got to do we started mm-hmm. adding you know some some add-on packages and and yeah. worked through some manufacturing stuff to build like the glove care kit yeah. and we went to batting gloves and and we did bat wraps we did a, a lot of different things and and so there's all these fun odd and end projects that i got to do but yeah. the people here were what kept bringing me back and yeah. and getting the opportunity to do something that i love to do and be in, still involved in baseball mm-hmm. use some of my, my education to kind of help keep that fresh yeah. um 
was was a blast and it was like i mean it was like seven six six seven years yeah. of off seasons doing that i i love that you said we like because technically you're still not employed but it's still the uh you know i don't know that's the big thing is when people leave our company there is an alumni program yeah. so it's still like you can still follow the success and we were actually just we were talking before we started here if you buy our glove care kit that we have right now like you're buying Tommy's glove care. He like made that glove care kit. So you can still get his legacy lives on, like even in our products today. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's fun. I mean, I, I was showing my kids like the brochure and they're like the original brochure had my arms and with the glove, <laughs> like holding the ball and the original video, you can still hear it. it's me. I wish I would have, uh -huh. I wish I could go back and like dub over my, the old bill. <laughs> I could be better. I promise. We but, could arrange it. <laughs> no, uh, but it, it, it was just fun. It was fun to see. And it was a fun time. I mean, there was a lot of really good people that worked here yeah. and there's obviously still are. And, and, and we got to do some really cool things and we had fun in the process too. Yeah. That was the best part. Yeah. I heard you mention you were talking before that you're like, man, half our day was playing wiffle ball down <laughs> on the, on the sport court. Yeah. So. If you had, if you had 10 minutes of free time, yeah. it was like a quick pickup wiffle ball game uh -huh. or a, some kind of like racquetball game yeah. or, you know, we'd go hop in the cage and take some swings. It was, it was fun. It was a good time. And yeah, like I said, a lot nice. of good people. And so naturally, so we have our gloves here. Uh, we got tons of them out there in our warehouse. So the glove that you use, so you, you get drafted, you're with the Red Sox, the glove that you used for, did you get it from here? Is that where you got your glove from? Or did you get that set up through a vendor? Or something? Yeah, so my, it's, it's a great question. So I had Mizuno in college. Okay. That's what we used when I was at Wichita State. I kind of fell in love with their gloves yeah. there. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the, the quality of the leather that, you know, mm -hmm. just that it was it was just different it was a little yeah. softer but still durable than yeah. what you would get from a rawlings at the time or some mm -hmm. of those uh, other ones but i just really liked the mizuno leather and, and yeah. the way the way it played so so i started um with i started I, I had them when i signed the agency i was with had to deal with rawlings okay. so i was getting rawlings love with them and then still ordering Mizuno stuff okay. or getting Mizuno stuff from, from <laughs> just ball gloves. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what do I want to do? And then I finally had a good enough season to where Mizuno wanted to sign me to <laughs> do nice. a deal. And so I, th then from that point on, I used Mizuno the rest of the time and, uh -huh. and got my stuff directly from them. So nice. um, yeah, it was a good, I loved them and, and uh, finally got a, a good deal with them to be able to use their glove and wear it, you know, uh -huh. and I was obviously, I wore Mizuno cleats too when, yeah. when I played. So it's funny that I work here now because as a kid, like, so I was one of nine kids growing up. I just got whatever I got. <laughs> and so was not really a gear guy. I would be like, see some bats and gloves and be like, that's a cool bat. Were you like a gear kid? Like, were you like, I got to have this bat. I got to have that glove or. No, my, it wasn't really about the glove. It was the color. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I was, was a black yeah. glove guy. Okay. I had to have a black glove. I, I don't know why. Uh -huh. Um, I liked black. Like, okay. and I, and I love, I've got plenty of like, tan and, and yeah. brown gloves and stuff now, but I needed a black glove. That okay. was my, my thing. The other bat, okay. the one, the only bat I can remember that I really wanted was an Easton Reflex Extended. <laughs> the orange and black yeah. Easton Reflex Extended. And the reason I wanted it is because I did, you know, it's like any, any other kid, right? You have one or two good games borrowing it from oh, yeah. your friend. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this, like, till, till the day I die. So my dad surprised me for my birthday with a new Easton reflex in it. And oh, I was man. pumped and <laughs> took it out. The first game I hit two homers Oh man! with it. And uh, he was like, why didn't we do this earlier? <laughs> I'm like, I know you're telling me like this. I don't know what we're, what we were waiting on, but um, that was the one bat to me that I remember uh -huh. was like, man, that, that was the one I used the most growing uh -huh. up for sure. That's funny. Nice. Yeah. So cool. Um, but no, so getting back to your gloves. So you had the black Mizuno and so for like when you were you when you were you get a new glove like did you use the same glove the whole time or were you like one glove a year I know everybody's a little bit different how do you do that Yeah I tried to go so I would always get two gloves okay. to kind of start the year cuz yeah. gloves will break in differently yeah. feel comfort whatever plus I liked one glove to play catch with every day and another okay. one to have for the game so basically my yearly rotation yeah. was I would have my my game my gamer glove would probably be the glove that I played catch with last the the previous year. Gotcha. Because mm -hmm. it's broken in, it feels yeah. good, it's comfortable. Then I get the new one that would become my catch play glove okay. for the next year. Yeah. As you slowly breaking it in, and that way I didn't have to rush to yeah. to get it. And then at some point during that season, that glove would maybe become the gamer, you okay. know, that kind of thing. 
But then you, every once in a while, you find one that's just like the best, right? Okay. It's like it fits great. You can keep the leather, you know, conditioned well. You yeah. can just restring it, and then um, you end up having just like a collection of them. So I had one that was that turned out to be gray by the end. It was done <laughs> because it was black, and it just I'd used it so much that was like my go-to. Yeah. And then I have another gamer, and then like you know you'd have your catch play gloves and yeah. things like that. So, um, but yeah, I. I I usually was a two glove guy to mm -hmm. start the year. Yeah. That because you're playing, especially professionally, you're playing catch every single day. Uh -huh. The last thing you want to do is take your your gamer and wear it out yeah. and break it. And next thing you know, you're trying to go out there and pitch and you know scrambling. The other thing that happens, I've always noticed with gloves, is they the the so I got a glove right here, and if you use it every day, this like wrist binding mm -hmm. just rots. Like mm -hmm. my favorite glove that I have now, that's how it looks, and it. it it always bothers me. Uh, but for you, I actually, if you notice here, so Tommy was a lefty. I got you a lefty glove. Any tips or anything like that? Like when you broke in, you just straight catch. I, if you're a pitcher, you play so much, you probably yeah, don't have to. you play a lot of catch. Like I, I mean, again, I'm not uh, uh, kind of trying to sell the glove care kit that we made. But um, <laughs> the, no, you're good. Do it. The, yeah, the, the mallet to me is so key because, yes, the only way, the best way to break in a glove is to play catch with it. No uh -huh. doubt about it. But sometimes, right? When you're playing catch with it, especially with a new glove, what yeah. do guys try to do? It's like, okay, it doesn't squeeze the right way, so I'm yeah. going to adjust the way I catch. Plus, you're playing catch with somebody throwing the ball at you, so mm -hmm. now you're like thinking about way too many things, and yeah. I've seen guys just get worn out, like hitting right. the chest and stuff because they're trying to catch it the right way. So the the mallet, I always love a mallet okay. to to just break it, like start that process. There's only mm -hmm. so many balls you can catch in a day. You yeah. can sit there and, and use the mallet and hit it 100 times. There you go. Um, what what got me like locked in on having a mallet was I used to do it with a baseball bat. You yeah. Know, when back you know when when we were growing up, I'd just sit there and use the bat to kind of help break it in. But I I I think the way these gloves are made now, and you see a lot of like back in the day, they were all just leather. Yeah. Like now you've got mesh. Now you've mm -hmm. got different types of leather. Now you've yeah. got um, you yeah. know it, different materials are being made. So we I I always would make sure it was conditioned. Like get it oiled up, get it you know malleable, uh -huh. and then just start playing catch, playing play, catch, playing catch. Then I think the most important thing is you've heard stories about people running over <laughs> with a car, put it under a mattress. Don't put it in the microwave. Don't you know, microwave. <laughs> like the the number one thing I like, and I like having something that could go around. Like put a baseball in it, mm -hmm. put a softball in it to kind of form that pocket. Uh -huh. You know, um, because you'll get you might get five of the exact same glove off the shelf and you yep. put them on your hand, they may feel five different ways. Yep. So um, I think it's so important to like get the feel of your hand on it, get the pocket built the right way. Uh -huh. um, and I was always a guy too. I, I don't know, you know, people do different things. I was always a two, in um, two in the pinky and mm -hmm. that made the big, the pocket bigger, you uh -huh. know, for me. Um, plus as a pitcher, I never liked having my finger out of the glove. I yeah. wanted to hide it in case uh -huh. I was tipping pitches and things like that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was kind of my my process of how I broke in gloves and had uh -huh. always done it. And there's so many different ways to do it, right? But it's the best. But there, it really is. Like everyone's like, this is the way, and you're like, eh, I mean, how, how, do you make plays with the glove? Then you broke it in. I, I've <laughs> seen. I mean, I've been around two two guys in particular that okay. are amazing: uh, Wilson Contreras and okay. Javier Baez. Two have of the strongest hands I've ever seen. Okay, Wilson Contreras can take a glove out of the wrapper. Put it on and catch a bullpen, no problem. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, guys. Some guys just have that ability and have those hands that are just so strong they uh -huh. can break in gloves on their own. Man. And Javi Baez would go through seven or eight gloves a year, and it was just like, yep, that one's ready. I'll take a couple grounders. Just strong hands, man. It's just amazing. That is wild. That's uh, <laughs> that's funny. But yeah, so hearkening back, I have a random gear question mm -hmm. for you. So I grew up in I grew up in this area, so I was kind of a WSU fan. A lot of people wore ringer cleats yeah. at Wichita State. And I would always see that and be like, that's so weird. Like, why don't they wear Nike? What is the story behind Wichita State and ringer cleats? So there was a transition year, I want to say probably right when I was a, when I was there, okay. that they were going from like East into Mizuno or okay. like in between had just came at the end of their contract with East End yeah. and 
And now they were kind of trying to find which way they wanted to go. And Mizuno uh-huh. at the time was going to do gloves. Okay. But they were only going to do like half the gloves. And it was like kind of like working through. So like Ringer stepped up and like, no, we want to sponsor you guys. We want to be your cleat. And uh-huh. and Gene being the smart genie is to save money. He's like, yeah, we're all wearing Ringers. I don't care <laughs> if you've ever worn them or not. This is what we're wearing. Okay. Um, and we ended up liking them. They were really? unique at the time. It was the first from what I had remembered, the ones that had the, the spikes at the front of the toe that were a circle. Okay, yeah. So they would rotate, you know, more. Uh-huh. They were meant to help, especially hitting, like to be able to dig and be yeah. able to spin and, and stuff like that. Um, and and so we used those for a few years. And then, but but then by my the end of my, I think, junior year, my senior year, we were full Mizuno at really? that point. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. always thought that that was, I would see that and I'd be like, Dang, that's kind of, you don't see that anymore. You don't, else. So, no, no. Um, and yeah, and nowadays, I was actually, I was reading an article. Um, they were like, it was, they were talking about Tommy Hotovy, pitching coach for the Chicago Cubs. Uh, they got a new head coach coming in. Tommy's a sneakerhead. Do we think we're going to see Craig Council wearing J's out to the mound next season? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I it's, when, when we, when we, hired him the first thing i went to my head is i I don't know if i've seen his lower half because (laughs) it's like you're looking in the other dugout and you always see the upper half and so i was like i wonder what kind of shoes there you go so um yeah we we might we might see some some flair there this year that's awesome that's so funny (laughs) and so so with with you kind of being sneakerhead shoe guys so you're always i i figure you're you're always a little conscious of uh of your of your style and stuff like that so about uh I would say I, I can't remember exactly what year it was in pro baseball, but you actually switched from being an overhead guy pitching to being a being a side armed. Did so? How did that start? I yeah. guess what what started that? So um, 2008, I had Tommy John <clears throat> surgery and um, rehab was good. Like rehab was fine. Um, mm-hmm. Got back to 2019, like halfway through 2000, 2019, came back. And I just, it, my stuff just wasn't as sharp. Uh-huh. Like the Velo was okay. I just didn't have what I had previous, what uh-huh. I felt like. So um, I chalked up 2019 to, to being like, okay, it's my first year of coming back. It was like July, or it was like a year to the day. It was like June 3rd, 2008, I had my surgery. Uh-huh. June 3rd, 2009, I had my first game back like okay. in the Meyer League. So the second half of that season was just kind of like getting back into the swing of things. And, yeah. Um, went to spring training in 2010. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, now I'm, everybody says the second year is the best. Second year is best. Well, the first month, I felt terrible. Uh-huh. Like it was just like, it just didn't feel the same. So I was like, I need to do something different. Like okay. if not, I'm going to be done. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh-huh. And, and I, I always been athletic. I'd always been the ability to throw balls from different arm slots, you know, out shagging BP or always flipping balls and spinning stuff. And, and I, so I just was like one day I'm like, I'm going to start throwing balls in during BP to the K to the, to the bucket sidearm okay. and just play around with arm slots. And yeah. Of course, the pitching coach is watching me over the course of like uh-huh. a month, and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And then one day, I just went up to him, I'm like, "Hey, I've got an idea." And he's like, "I know what your idea is. Let's <laughs> go to the mound uh-huh. and let's go try to throw some." Yeah. And and he, um, I'll never forget where we were. We were in Reading, Pennsylvania, Double uh, A for the Phillies. And after BP, he the pitching coach went down and got behind the plate, and I threw some like sidearm fastballs, a couple of breaking balls, and. I was like, how's it look? And he's like, oh, it looks good. And I go, okay, well, if I get in the game tonight, I'm doing it. And he's okay. like, whoa, you know, like, well, we'll see. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do it in the uh-huh. game. And he's just, he started laughing because he knew, like, I've been thinking about it. And sure enough, I get in the game that night and do it. And and I just, it just kind of, it kind of became part of me. I, it uh-huh. was comfortable. Um, I was able to move arm slots around and it really changed not only my stuff because I was uh-huh. able to use, back then I didn't realize bio, the biomechanical side of what I was doing yeah. by changing my arm slot. Yeah. Um, it actually gave me more power. I was stronger. I, I had better stuff. It was crisper. Yeah. Plus it was more deceptive. So uh-huh. um, yeah. And then from that point on, I kind of took ownership of it. And 2011 was my first full year of doing it. And I uh-huh. got called up um, June 3rd, you know, 2011. Nice. How was your, so that was with the, with the Red Sox, right? Yeah. How was your, what was your debut? What'd you do? Um, so debut, um, I was against Oakland in, in Boston and, um, back then, you know, lefty situational relievers could pitch every single day and you you only had to face one hitter. So, um, I came in, um, and faced David DeJesus, um, got him, you know, Royals legend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
got him to hit into a ground ball. Um, that was it. One like one at bat. I think it was like three pitches. Yeah. Um, and and got out of it. Got out of the inning and, and moved on. Next day, um, get up again. Okay. And now it's first and second. We're in a one run ball game, and David DeJesus is up with one out. I come in, ground ball, double play, <laughs> get out of it. So um, the next day. It's my third. My, I've never thrown three days in a row, but yeah. you're in the big leagues now. You'll do whatever you got to yeah, do. Yeah, um, I, I, There's a runner on first and two outs. Um, again, like a close game. I come in. I, I don't remember who the first hitter was. I walked him. It was like a long at bat. But then David DeJesus <laughs> was on deck, and I got DeJesus to hit into a ground ball. And so I, my first technically four outs in the big leagues uh-huh. were all David DeJesus at bats, and one of them was a double play. So he's technically the first – guy i got out every single time and this gets better because he's a radio guy for the cubs right so do you give him trouble about that so own you (laughs) no it was it was funny at the time you know when i was in it like theo epsicus theo was with boston Uh he was like you i was like he's like i don't know if you're any good i know you're a david de jesus specialist so (laughs) like because back then you were just lefty specialist and and then you know i i got to meet david obviously being around the cubs and 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 it was funny to tell that story just because he knew like because coco crisp was on first base on my debut so it was coco crisp on first and david de jesus hitting and i'm coming up a royals fan like you those are two guys that i watched Uh play and you know so we ended up you know connecting on some of that stuff and it was funny we had a good laugh and I was like, yeah, obviously it didn't work out because he had a way longer <laughs> career than I did, and you know. Um, but no, it was it was a pretty fun way to experience your uh-huh. your debut in, yeah. in the big leagues. That is super cool. Okay, so 2012, you find yourself with the Royals. You make it up again to the bigs, um, and then a couple years later, 2014, you're in spring training with the Cubs, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. And if I if I read correctly, is that that was you got hurt for the final time that kind of ended your career? Yeah, yeah. and in. 14, I was I was pitching in the game against the Indians, or sorry, Indians at the time, Guardians now, mm-hmm. um, in at their ballpark. And I threw a pitch and felt like this weird pop in my shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, didn't it wasn't like overly painful, it was just uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, let it rest for like a week, wasn't getting any better. I basically like tore cartilage in my shoulder, which is pretty rare. Um, labrum was actually pretty good, rotator okay. guff was pretty good. Uh-huh. Um, so had to have a microfracture surgery in my shoulder, which most people get in their knees and hips. Okay. Um, oh, so man. pretty unique, but uh-huh. basically it's an arthritic shoulder from throwing yeah. as much as I have. Uh-huh. Um, and I knew I was going to be done done playing, so I really wanted to try to find something else that I could do yeah. in the game uh-huh. at that time. Nice. Um, so and that was I and so I believe you bounced back pretty fast because I think I, I wanted to make sure that I got your title re- correct here. So I believe that you got hired as the coordinator of advanced scouting with an emphasis in run prevention. Yes. Is that right? That's yeah. a heck of a title. Um, how did you bounce so fast from pitching in spring training and then when you got that new role with the Cubs? So. Um, I didn't, the, the number one answer to that is I didn't wait around very long. Okay. I kind of knew right away what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I, I knew I had a short window to kind of make a decision. I, either I was going to stay in the game and try to find something I was passionate about yeah. or move on uh-huh. like, and, yeah. and do something else. And, and I had some other things lined up that I was interested in doing, but I didn't want to miss that window of opportunity to kind of see what baseball was going to do. Yeah. Um, I had the analytics background. Mm-hmm. Being able to work here with with pro athlete and the just bats and just gloves, Mm -hmm. I was able to keep working on things that I like to do. So I had this kind of like almost like a resume built of not just the playing resume, but actually some real world um, life experiences. Uh And and I one thing I was missing and I was there was a gap in my mind at the time was a lot more of the analytical side and what it was trying to 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 tell us. So. I was rehabbing in the, here in Kansas City in the summer. I found an online course at Boston University about okay. sabermetrics. It was called Sabermetrics 101. Right. And it was like a, it, it was part history, part um, data an- analysis, part um, uh, projects you could work on. And it went through like the history of like baseball and how stats have become prevalent okay. and how long they've collected data. Yeah. And the whole, it went through all the, um, you know, the money ball aspect of Mm -hmm. how they started evaluating data. And it really helped me one, like refresh all of my 
school knowledge I had learned, the, fi yeah. the finance background, but all the economics, the, the statistics, the yeah. um, being able to analyze information and then do it like in, in a baseball environment using baseball data. And mm -hmm. like, it was a really fun way to kind of transition yeah. um, all that information. And so it really helped me start peaking my interest in where the game was going. Because at the time in 14, we were starting to get some pitch level data. We were starting to get some more, um, granular data, but it was still very much like the money ball. Like how do you evaluate slug versus OPS? And, yeah. you know, we're going from average to slug, slug to OPS, OPS, no, like OPS plus wasn't there. Hit effects <laughs> number, like none of that stuff was around. Yeah. So, uh -huh. um, there was a, a rare window for me of a guy who had played long enough to understand the game to, to a certain extent, the finance, the, the math background to be able to understand data analytics yeah. and then be able to speak all the different languages yeah. it was going to take to help. And my goal at the time was not to be a major league pitching coach. I tell people that all the time. <laughs> my goal was to help players understand what information was telling them and help coaches understand what information was telling them and uh -huh. be a resource for them as the game grew. And so when we hired Joe Madden in 2015, Joe was coming from Tampa with an organization that could understand information, yeah. could handle it. And, and so it just felt like the right fit at the time with, with Theo and Jed being the head guys in, in Chicago, with Joe coming on, he wanted to have some more people that he could bounce ideas off of and can help answer those questions and dig into some information. So that's kind of how it all, nice. it all started. And with advanced scouting, so you were doing a lot of like, Cubs are playing, you guys are playing St. Louis this week and you play Brewers um, during the week, you were scouting the brew, like you were seeing what the brewers were doing, correct? Yeah, so it was a hybrid of where, like, you know, the the traditional advanced scouts would sit in the stands and watch one team write up a report, send it to the team, and yeah. get ready for the game. It was kind of a hybrid. Like I was still doing um, a lot of the prep work for the the, the team coming up, digging okay. into team tendencies and strategies and stuff, breaking down hitters, helping helping our coaching staff really mm -hmm. dig into hitters and what they wanted to do and support them there, but also like be in be present in the series that we were playing in gotcha. like matchups how we wanted to line up guys in the bullpen i did all the infield and outfield positioning um, okay. tied that to how we were going to pitch and how we could maximize you know preventing runs yeah. so anything that had to do with preventing runs from scoring uh -huh. i was going to have uh, a hand in and obviously early i learned a lot from the, from Joe Madden and the coaching staff we had. We had a r really good staff of veteran guys that had been around the game, and I learned a ton. Mm -hmm. And then I just helped them understand and how, how we could supplement all this new information and new data into the things that, that they had been traditionally doing. It was pretty fun. Nice. And you were a part of you and did the, uh, the Billy Goat curse with them. So uh, yeah. you got a ring. What what merits wearing the ring out? Like when does when does one wear the the World Series ring? Yeah, I'm kicking Obviously myself not for a podcast. I, I know I'm <laughs> kicking myself for not having it today. But um, you know, I I wear it honestly more whenever I go to events. Yeah. you know, because people want to see it when uh -huh. I'm around Chicago. If if people want to, you know, if I'm going somewhere, I'm definitely gonna wear it there. Yeah. But yeah, I get more of a kick out of other people wearing it than yeah. I do. You yeah. know, for me, it's and it's because it's so big. You know, really it is. is. Like when we got them. Um, it, I'll never forget, like we were shaking hands and everybody, like after a week, everybody's hands are just raw because no one wanted to take <laughs> it off, but everybody was wearing it and yeah. everybody wanted to see it. So you're taking it on and off and oh, shaking man. hands and everybody's fingers are like all scabbed up on the inside. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it was, a, it was a special time. It, it was, a, a you know, everybody knows the history of the yeah. Cubs and, and being years. part of that and seeing the 7 million people come out for for the parade and just be able to experience that. It's just, it's, it's, there's nothing, there was nothing like it. it was insane. Yeah. And so fast forward from when you guys won in 2016 to almost three years later, and you actually, like you mentioned earlier, you never set out to do this, but you were hired as the pitching coach for the Chicago Cubs. Um, I just have to know because so, so here, so I used to work in the contact center and during baseball season, my favorite day of the week was when I would work on a Friday during the day because the Cubs always played during the day and the game would, we always, we had a TV running. So the game would always be up there. Is there any better feeling? This is going to be a long winded question, but is there a better feeling than winning a Friday matinee at Wrigley, hearing everybody sing go Cubs go, and then still getting to go home and spend the <laughs> evening with your family? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, I it's, it is so special to be, part of an organization with so much history that uh -huh. has some of these these 
things that are layered in, you uh-huh. know, and, and you, the stadium's built into the community and yeah. you feel like you're part of the, of the, of the city of the North side there in Wrigleyville. And they call it that for a reason. Cause you're like, you literally are walking down the street and you see people all the time and yeah. say hi to the firemen at the fire station. Mm-hmm. And, and you're in, you are literally in the fans, in the community. And it's really cool. And being able to be a part of that, play those day games mm-hmm. and, and have the experience of like winning and hearing that it, it, it is, it's just such a cool tradition that uh-huh. they, that they do and that they've upheld. And, and, there are like when you when we bring in new free agents, yeah, you'd be surprised how many of them look forward to all the day games, oh. and <laughs> and now our schedule gets tough at times because it's uh. like we bounce back and forth. There's a lot of times we have a three game series on the road of all night games, and then have a day game at oh, home man. to start a series. So those aren't fun, but like you said, like you can guys can have a game, be be home by five o'clock, uh-huh. going going to dinner at the amazing restaurants that Chicago has to offer uh-huh. and all the, and get to experience all those things. And then, you know, and then be at the field at nine o'clock the next day yeah. for another game. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's more like a normal nine to five yeah. job or eight to five job yeah. that people would have than you would, you know, a lot of other cities. That's pretty fun. I I'll never forget. I, in 2015, the Royals played the Cubs and uh, one of the games got rained out in Chicago, and they mm. rescheduled it for September. And I had tickets for that game. I was like, I'm going to the game. <laughs> so I was actually working here. I drove through the night to Chicago to go to the game, and the Cubs hit a walk-off home run. And, like, the Royals were great that year. Yeah. So I was kind of mad because we were in a little bit of, like, a race. And um, But when they sang the song, I'd never experienced that before. And I was like, I'm so mad, but this is really cool. All at the same <laughs> it time. is a cool experience. So, it, uh, is, it really is. And, and it's again, it just uh, shows you how connected the team is uh-huh. with, with the fans and the community. And um, it, it, you get, it gives you goosebumps. Still, it gives me goosebumps even thinking about yeah, it right now. It's just because sure. you, know, you, you, just, you know how invested everything is. And there's days... Look, we spend a lot of time in the locker room, a lot of time in the clubhouse, and you're grinding, and you're you're on computers, and you're in meetings, and all that stuff. And then mm-hmm. you walk out, and you walk up those steps, and you see the Ivy, and you see Wrigley Field, and you remember that, like, okay, this is like I'm I'm part of something bigger than myself. Yeah, you know, I'm uh-huh. I'm the organization, the the way the fans treat the players, and and ownership treats the fans. Like it's it's just it's a fun yeah. organization to be a part of for sure. That's pretty cool. So with you being with the Cubs right now, so you've gotten to be with like lots of big name pitchers. John Lester's one of the big ones that comes to my mm-hmm. mind. You Darvish, Marcus Stroman, and Kyle Hendricks has been there the entire time that you've been there, which yeah. is pretty cool. And with the way that, you know, we see big league baseball, like when you get to the highest level, it's it's kind of a bottom line business. So you would think that there might not be as many opportunities for like those kind of heartfelt moments. But is there any like with any of your pitchers, is there any like real powerful interaction that comes to mind that you've been able to share with one of them or something like that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much, you get to know these guys so well mm-hmm. um, over the course of their careers and uh-huh. over the over the years, and and each year is different. Yeah. It really is. There's there's been so many times where I've been, you know at tears or close to tears with guys in the outfield talking uh-huh. about their families, talking about their careers, talking about where they are in their life. And, and it's not just pitching, you know, yeah. it's just uh-huh. like, it's life stuff you talk about with guys. We have uh-huh. guys having babies for the first time that yeah. like I, you know, was coaching when they weren't even married, you know, okay, it's like, yeah. you, you think it's like, Holy cow. Now they're married. Now you, now they're having kids. Now they're having actual parental uh, questions. It's not, <laughs> you know, like you feel like you're a mentor in a lot of different ways, not just as a pitching coach. Yeah. Um, and I've learned a ton from a lot of these veteran guys. I've been around too. I've been lucky to be around John Lester. And like you said, Lackey and Darvish and mm-hmm. some of these guys, um, to pinpoint one exact conversation <laughs> is tough. The the one thing I would say, and, and I, I I think one of my favorite guys I've ever been yep. around is you, Darvish. Okay, and yeah. Dar and, and and for a lot of different reasons. I yeah. think he's a great pitcher. I think he's a great human. I think mm-hmm. he does a lot for the communities. I think he's um, he's such a unique background coming from Japan and yeah. and what he went through with Texas and then L.A. and stuff and. And there was a conversation I had with him 
once, and I think it was 2018 uh-huh. when we first got him, and he was struggling, and he was hurt, and he wasn't feeling good, and he was grinding, and he's just like, like asking me, like, what do I do? You know, the fans are on me. You know, like I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. Like he's had a lot of questions. I remember uh-huh. saying, like, look, are are you doing everything you can to be? To be to get back and be healthy. He's like, yeah, I just, but I feel like I'm letting the team down. I feel like I'm letting the other, you know, the the fans down, the ownership down. I'm uh-huh. like, look, like, don't look at it that way. You know, we want what's best for you. Don't feel like you have to please everybody else. You're gonna please everybody else by being you, Darvish, dominant pitcher on the on the field, plus all the things you do off the field and the person you are and the teammate you are. And mm-hmm. I remember having that conversation with him, and and I don't know if that impacted anything in the in you know, how, how he was able to kind of make some adjustments, but he went into 2019 and had a chip on his shoulder from all the stuff that he had the year before and was able mm-hmm. to go out and, and dominate. And, yeah. and now he's been, you know, he just signed another, I think three year, four yeah. year extension and continued to pitch and, and, and dominate at a, at a older age, you yeah. know? And, um, I, I think that one for me really stands out because of where, how how established he was, where he was at in his career. He had enough trust in me to kind of confide in some things that he was feeling and going yeah. through, and and we were able to work through that together. And and the other one for me is Kyle Hendricks. Like you you mentioned, I think seeing Kyle come over, you know, and and see him in fourteen and fifteen, and now where he is in two thousand going into two thousand twenty four. We've been together for ten years, <laughs> um, and cool. he's he's a guy. I mean, I've seen him, you know, get married. I've seen him, you know, have a baby. Like uh-huh. you've you've seen these guys grow in their life not just as a as a pitcher and, and, and a player but just mm-hmm. as a teammate and he's such a an example of what you want people to be in your organization hard worker yeah. um takes care of his business doesn't cause any drama yeah. just a lot of those things so those two guys for me really stand out of, of of those interactions that you really hold on to that's awesome do you ever get out and toss with the guys still like do you do long all toss? the time really i i have a unique i i never could throw hard i mean my 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 strengths were not velocity it uh-huh. was command yeah. i have a unique ability to like hit things with baseball <laughs> so i have to just every once in a while i've got to remind them that i've got the ability to to hit my spot <laughs> um and and i do as much as i can as long as my shoulder yeah. will hold up but no we have a good time I, especially with a lot of the pitch design work we do and a lot of the things it's refreshing to a pitcher to see like oh if i'm gonna if i want to work on something with you this is how i hold it and this is how i'm gonna throw it and i can you can yeah. replicate that at yeah. some point i'm not gonna be able to do that anymore <laughs> but i definitely like to go out and show off whenever i can this is a personal interest right here but i've ne- i don't know that i've ever seen a former sidearm submarine pit do you throw long toss sidearm or do you go over no the top? it's a great question i mean some guys can i i only went to 90 feet that was my max. okay because okay. after 90 feet i started changing my mechanics yeah i guess it wouldn't really be of any use yeah so i would throw most of my long toss and most of my catch play was over the top even when okay. i dropped down and then like between 60 75 feet i would throw sidearm to okay. kind of get my rhythm there and stuff but most of my long toss was all over really? the top yeah. that's funny nice yeah. Well, man, thanks for joining us here. This has been an awesome conversation. We before we get off, we always do three strikes. Okay. So we got we got three questions, twenty seconds to answer each question, like the pitch clock. Uh, I'm just first ones might take a little bit longer. You're but good. You played parts of ten seasons in the minor leagues. What was the worst bus ride that you ever experienced while you were in the minor leagues? Easy question. Um, <laughs> my first, I got called up to Double A. Um, the my first start, I flew in. To Erie, Pennsylvania, they lost my luggage. I had to pitch. I had to pitch with um, somebody else's gear. Okay, that wasn't even my first bus ride. The next start, okay, we're playing in Trenton, and we're driving from Portland, Maine, to Trenton, New Jersey. Okay, we leave at six in the morning. The bus breaks down at noon. We're on the side of the highway for uh-huh. three hours. Um, we're watching. I'm watching the clock go by. Watching the clock. It's supposed to start that night. Um, the bus. The second bus finally shows up. Okay. We're two hours from the, s- the stadium. So seven o'clock game. At best, we're going to get there at six o'clock. So okay. I got all my gear out from underneath the bus, uh-huh. put it on. I'm changing on the bus. I'm <laughs> stretching up and down the, the aisles. We get there 30 minutes before game time. And I go walk right off the bus to okay. start. I threw four really good innings and nice. then gave up a grand slam in the fifth. And ah. I just completely ran out of gas. But that was my first double A bus ride. Okay, by far the worst. One. By <laughs> far the funny. worst. One. It's uh, you would think even in the minor leagues, you, you know, they're always there. 
the teams are, but you don't know what time they got there. No, so, so. no, <laughs> especially like you, you know, sometimes you drive over the, all, all through the night, get there and, uh -huh. and have a, can stay at the hotel or times you leave in the morning because teams are trying to save money on yeah. the hotel nights oh, and stuff. So yeah, that was by far my worst. <laughs> That's funny. And sticking with travel. So the off season rolls around. So you're in Chicago right now as the pitching coach, you come to Kansas city in your off seasons to live. Is there anywhere else that you have to travel? Like when you, when the off season comes around? Yeah, I'm we've, we love anywhere warm. Okay. That's kind of our, yeah. our go-to, you uh -huh. know, we, my, my dad, um, had, lives out in Fort Myers, Florida okay. now. Nice. Um, he fell in love with that area when I was playing with the Red Sox and going to spring training uh -huh. and, and has kind of pseudo, like not retired, is working there, but wanted to retire there anyway. Yeah. So that's a place we always like to go. But anywhere warm, anywhere where there's a beach nice. uh, that I can try to get to is, is a priority. There you go. And then last one. So this summer, you're going to be celebrating 20 years in professional baseball. Yeah. Um, so do you think now that you've been around pro players for forever, could you coach a little league baseball team or would it drive you nuts? No, I, I absolutely think I could. could. And, and having a 12 year old son that plays and my uh -huh. daughter it's 10 plays softball. Like I, I love it, man, because okay. I'll be, I tell people this all the time. I tell the coaches all the time, the same conversations you're having with 12 year old kids. I'm having with 28 year old <laughs> kids. They, it doesn't change. Yeah, no, I believe like, it. The, the, the amount of pushback might change, uh -huh. you know, um, or, or guy, what guys understand, but you're having the same conversations. Um, mm -hmm. the thing I love about being around little league and being around like the youth sports is because the love of the game is so prevalent. Uh -huh. Kids are going to go out there and, and they want to get there early because they want to go on the field and play pepper with their teammates. They mm -hmm. want to play catch and they want to be around the kids and eat sunflower seeds and stuff. And, and obviously the, the professional level loses some of that at times because it's a business and it's yeah. a job and it's a lifestyle. But um, that part of it for me never changes. And, and, and I love being able to be around it. And anytime I'm in town, like I love that my son plays fall ball because I can come back and be around the team and help the coaches. I spend time helping coach the coaches that they oh, yeah. have nice. and, and answer questions that they have. And I try to be as, as involved and, and available to them as I can. But I, I think I, I could, and I'd, nice. I'd love doing it. We might see that maybe in the future. That's then. right. So, that's fun. Well, thanks again for joining. If, if anybody listening or watching, if they want to, interact with you do you have any social social media that you're active on right now yeah i mean on on x like i'm, yeah. I'm usually pretty I'm, I'm i don't post all the time i'm definitely on it all the time and a lot of people instagram's kind of been my you know my go-to people send me messages and stuff yeah. so um pretty simple i think i had sad i don't even know i think it's just tommy dot at it on <laughs> instagram so it's pretty easy to find me but um yeah i love i love interacting with fans i love being able to do stuff like this yeah. and and um yeah thanks for having me yeah thanks for much for, so much for coming on all right if you enjoyed the podcast definitely go ahead and give us a five-star rating we're on spotify and apple as well and as always you can watch on youtube